Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Anderson. I am the chief curator here at the National Nordic Museum, and I am th so thrilled to welcome you to the first in the What is Nordic Design series of programs. This series has been supported by Nordic Culture Fund and Arts Fund and has been in the works and planning over a couple years, actually. Conceived of this as a way to bring together leading museum professionals, um, design historians in the Nordic countries and in North America to consider national versus pan-Nordic design. And as I mentioned, this is the first in a series, so this one's devoted to Finland. But later in October, you can enjoy programs that are focused on Sweden, Iceland, and Denmark, and in December, on Norway. All of them will be recorded, so please tell anyone who you think might be interested, a design enthusiast, perhaps. First, I will introduce uh, Susanna Thiel and also Shelley Salem, who will be uh, joining Susanna in conversation following her pr presentation. Susanna Thiel has been serving as the head of collections at Design Museum Helsinki since 2020. In her role, she's been dedicated to the development of open access collections, making the museum's treasures more accessible to a wider audience. Her involvement in the working group for activity-based exhibitions has provided visitors with a unique perspective into the design workings of the museum. With a knack for curatorial work, she has collaborated on a number of exhibitions that blend artistry and storytelling to resonate with diverse audiences. Beyond her exhibition contributions, she has also shared her expertise through articles published on the collections of Design Museum Helsinki, contributing to a deeper understanding of their cultural importance. And then she'll be joined in conversation by Shelley Salem, the Curator of Design and Contemporary Art at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields in Indianapolis, of course, where she develops the curatorial program for one of the largest museum design collections in the nation and two historic homes. She has curated, published, and lectured widely on topics related to modern and contemporary design, craft, and art, and her work often examines the increasingly nebulous boundaries between these disciplines. Her current curatorial project is Daughter, Mother, Ancestor, Threads of Connection, which explores the ways that women artists in the past and present preserve intergenerational skill sharing and materialize familial love through longstanding traditions in textile work. She has previously held curatorial positions at Cranbrook Art Museum in Bluefield Hills, Michigan, and the Museum of Arts and Design in New York. She's taught design history at Parsons, the new school of design, and lectured at the history of design and, um, and uh, <coughs> history of design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, where she received her MA in the history of decorative arts and design in 2013. So first, welcome to the stage, Susanna Thiel. Thank you. Okay, hello, my name is Susanna Thiel. I'm a chief curator of collections at the Design Museum in Helsinki. And uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for having me here at Seattle. This is my first time ever in the United States, so I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> and I also hope my English is sufficient enough for you all <laughs> to understand. <coughs> so, um, I... Uh, assume that uh, you know something about Finland and Helsinki when where our museum is located. So Helsinki is the capital of Finland, uh, around about 500,000 uh, um, citizens there residing, and uh, our museum is one of the oldest museums in the Helsinki area. So we are celebrating our 150th anniversary to this year. So um, the collections were uh, first um, uh, introduced uh, to a wider audience in 1874. So on the topic of today, what is Nordic design Finland? Um, when I think about Nordic design, often there comes the um, um, conclusion that uh, there are several differences on Scandinavian and Nordic design. So Nordic design is much more wider uh, thing to grasp uh, in its sense. Um, of course, the Finnish design itself is also one thing that uh, one would like to discuss further, that uh, has it got anything uh, different 
than, for example, Swedish or Norwegian uh, design? And on the other hand, uh, would there be some sort of uh, similarities or uh, is there something else uh, to think about when it comes to Finnish design and Nordic design in this uh, context? So as I mentioned, our collection is from 1874 and it was originally uh, um, built uh, as an educational collection and um, uh, it was uh, meant for the craft school of uh, art and design in Helsinki that was uh, established in 1871 and the pupils and students at the craft school were supposed to get an idea, a general idea that what the industrialization as well as the um, uh, good taste in other European uh, countries or around the world would be like and uh, as you know, Finland has been this kind of a rural country, uh, are uh, mainly uh, uh, focusing on craftsmanship throughout the decades until the late, very late 20th century. So um, that is the reason why uh, people of that era in 1870s thought that it would be a great idea to sort of educate the wider audience with these uh, findings from world fairs as well as uh, larger world exhibitions. And um, there were also a tradition of putting together Finnish exhibitions later in 1880s. One of the first um, um, projects were done by the Friends of the Finnish Handicraft, founded in early 1880s. And uh, this is a uh, exhibition plan made by a Finnish architect, uh, Johan Jakob Arenberg, uh, who was um, also great grandfather of Kai Frank, a later well-known designer, Finnish designer. And uh, the parents of the Finnish handicraft uh, wanted to um, show a more of this kind of a traditional, maybe a bit mythical way of doing uh, handicrafts, especially um, textile work. And uh, they gathered a lot of samples from around Karelia and uh, eastern parts of Finland and put together this kind of an educational collection of different textile pieces. And here you can see a variety of these Karelianism textiles put together. Uh, this was an exhibition um, um, planned to be in Copenhagen in 1888. And uh, some of the pieces have been actually uh, done and are part of the Design Museum collection now. Um, as I mentioned, all the world uh, fairs, as well as the, the original um, uh, fairs in general, were a great place for Finnish uh, architects, as well as visual artists, to present their work, as well as then also... Sorry, I'm going to change the slide. As well as also uh, for the new uh, craft school uh, students, to present their work. And here you can see um, a room from the Finnish Paris Pavilion in 1900 uh, World Fair. The pavilion itself was designed by Elia Saarinen, Armas Lindgren and uh, Hermann Jeselius, uh, three young thriving architects uh, who won the competition for this separate pavilion in uh, 1898. And amongst all of the uh, exhibits there was uh, Irish Room. This uh, was um, produced by a company based in Porvo, Borgo, in, in Finland. And uh, all of the furniture you can see here are designed by Axel Gallen, later known as Axel Gallen Kallela, a famous Finnish visual artist. And all of the uh, um, textiles have been woven uh, or done by the Friends of the Finnish Handicraft, and on the shelves and on the table you can see pottery by Iris Factory and a Belgian-based uh, ceramist called Alfred William Finch. So this was considered to be uh, the height of the Finnish national style. Lots of uh, inspiration from the flora and fauna of, the, of Finnish uh, nature, as well as uh, traditional wood materials and carpentry used on the objects. And um, Finland had a separate uh, exhibition building 
in the Paris Pavilion, but then again, all of the industrial products uh, represented on the same exhibition World Fair were uh, located in the Russian Pavilion. So I'm sure you're familiar with our history. It's a bit of a complex thing. <laughs> we have been part of the Swedish uh, Empire or the kingdom, and then later in 1809, we're part of the uh, Russian Empire and gained our independence as late as in 1917. So that is why uh, it is always like we've been the small uh, brothers, little brothers for other Nordic countries in a way that we've come a bit late to the scene. As I mentioned, Elia Saarinen, and Hermann Jeselius and Armas Lindgren, so they also uh, produced more of this uh, Finnish uh, traditional style and uh, started to make this kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, what you would call a whole building home as an artwork kind of idea. Uh, this is an interior design made by Elia Saarinen for Vittorp, which is a small, mm, or should I say small, a minor manor in, in located nearby Espo in <coughs> Helsinki. Uh, metropolitan area uh, and they also had their own studio as well as their their home the three architects called Vitresk nearby uh, Kirkonummi, Turkslet also in the southern area of Finland and these are uh, the heights of the so-called Art Nouveau or Jugendstil as well as the National Romanticism era uh, in Finland so um, all of the designs, as well as the interior decoration, as well as the architecture, and all small details were designed by the three architects themselves. Later, Elia Saarinen moved to the United States, and uh, this was due to, for example, rifts with other architects and the kind of a style, should it be nationalist or should it, or national romanticist, or should it be more rational in a way, so uh, the kind of a rift with, uh, for example, Sigurd Frosteros and Gustav Strengel was too heavy a burden for Saarinen, and that was originally one of the um, facts that uh, then uh, made him move with his family to the States. I'm sure Shelley will tell you more about this when we discuss it further. Okay. As I mentioned, friends of the Finnish handicraft, so there were lots of Finnish visual artists who made uh, designs for uh, the handicraft um, versions. These were all done uh, mostly on a uh, home base so that uh, you would buy the actual design from friends of the Finnish handicraft and then weave or do the Ryu rug for yourself. So a lot of the uh, craftsmanship was still in uh, other families or in smaller studios and not that much as an industrial based uh, kind of a thing going on. This is uh, Wein Blumstedt's uh, Uhri um, and it has a lot of this kind of a Karelian mythology as well as uh, the national epos of Finland called Kalevala. So inspiration from those two pieces. And architects also made a few other things like designs uh, for glass factories. So the um, Nutajärvi glass factory held its first uh, art glass competition in 1905. And uh, here you can see the winning version of flower vase by Walter Jung, a Finnish designer. And it was important to get uh, in-house designers as well as freelance designers to do design for uh, Finnish factories and industry in general because all of the models had been uh, um, influenced uh, by let's say Central European as well as uh, Swedish designers and glass factory workers for example so uh, this was quest for a national style and uh, this is one of the more popular things back in the United States. So Arabia uh, Porcelain Factory was founded in 1874. And uh, they had uh, quite a lot of export uh, goods coming to the United States. And the Fenia vase collection that you can see here was one of the most uh, important export goods that could be found here. There are several uh, private collectors that I know 
on the state side that still do take seriously their um, collecting of Fenya vases. And uh, these were usually traditional Karelian style motifs that were uh, put on, uh, decora on as a decoration. And uh, it was Jack Arenberg, as well as a Swedish born uh, designer, um, Ture Öberg, who together designed this series of vases. And uh, they were produced from 1900 until 1920. So in Arabia's uh, history, it was quite a long time frame to do the production. And uh, it was actually requested on the um, Paris World Fair by, an, um, by a um, United States collector that Arabia should put these vases on uh, production or in production. So, as I mentioned, Finland gained independence in 1917 in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution. And after that, uh, we had a, a quite bloody um, civil war, which then halted all design and architecture ventures for quite a long time. And the nation was blooming back in late 1920s when uh, the new parliament building was starting to be designed in Helsinki. And uh, here you can see a chair uh, consisting of uh, neoclassical elements by J.S. Siren, the architect who designed the parliament building, and uh, also Swedish uh, inspiration on the uh, cup over there uh, by Henry Eriksson, a uh, Finnish glass designer who was really interested in the, um, the designs and especially the engravings done by the, um, by the Swedish uh, artists like Edvard Halt. So as you can see, a lot of the inspiration uh, for Finnish design in 1910s and 1920s came from Sweden. And uh, we had uh, quite a tight connection to Swedish uh, Sleitvereningen and uh, and also um, gained some artistic knowledge from Sweden for that time. And um, I'm sure that this is one of the most familiar pieces <laughs> all around the world, namely uh, Alvar Aalto's uh, Savoy vase or Aalto vase uh, from 1936-37. It was launched for the Savoy restaurant in uh, Helsinki, and um, there were several different kind of uh, um, several several uh, different versions of the piece. And uh, this one is the original one that then has evolved into the old ways that we now see in every Scandinavian design shop and also in Itala stores around the world. Um, it was hard to manufacture, uh, the wooden molds would wear out easily and uh, it was sort of an experimental thing, actually more like an art glass piece than a vase, but vase it is nowadays. And uh, 1929 Alto also won the Paimio sanitary competition and uh, started to design uh, new furniture. Uh, mainly low cost and uh, made out of pent, bent birch plywood and would be easy to take care of and easy to keep clean for the tuberculosis patients that were, there were a, a large number of those in Finland back in 1920s and 1930s. So uh, the chair model on the uh, slide is also made for the Paimio sanatorium. The wartime the era in 1940s was, uh, uh, there was a lack of uh, uh, raw material. Uh, most of the men and women were on front and uh, there wasn't that much design to talk about. Of course, there were a few uh, women designers who still had their studios and workshops uh, running even in 1940s, early 1940s, but as there was lack of the raw material, so the problem was that uh, there wasn't that much 
uh, to begin with, to start with, uh, and uh, to actually made anything out of. And after the war came the low-cost furniture era. As you can see, there were lots of furniture design uh, from 1920s onward. And uh, as you know, Finland has a lot of forests and a lot of wood material to work on. So Ilmari Tapiovara's uh, domus chairs for the domus student dormitory in Helsinki were uh, the start of this kind of a stackable uh, do-it-yourself trend in Finland in 1946. So these would come in flat packages and you would put them together yourself. Uh, Kia style, <laughs> couple of uh, decays earlier than that, and uh, you would screw yourself the, the 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 final pieces on, as you can see in the detailed photo. So this was a, a large um, effort to make af right after the war. There were a lot of um, uh, Karelian refugees that had to be housed, and there was a great housing sh shortage. Uh, all around Finland, as well as uh, shortage on uh, all kinds of everyday wear. So this was also the start for the booming design um, entrepreneurs uh, of 1950s and 1960s, because everybody had to leave everything uh, back behind the border when they were evacuated from the Karelia, and there were around about 400,000 refugees that needed to be housed in quite a small, short time uh, frame. So uh, that was the, one of the first reasons why there was some, so much new Finnish design later after the Second World War. Other was that we were forced to pay quite a heavy amount of money for uh, Russia for losing the war, and uh, that also needed to be uh, cost or cotton on some premises. So there were a lot of industry and the industry was blooming in the 1950s. So back to the state side. Uh, in New York, uh, Arne Ervi designed uh, the Finland house, which was a um, sort of a window for Finnish design in the late 1940s here in the United States. So uh, the interior decoration was uh, designed also by Arne Ervi and uh, his um, architectural bureau, but uh, the lights here are by Paavo Tunel, a Finnish uh, well-known light fixture designer. And uh, Tunel's career has been uh, going on and off in 1920s and 1930s in Finland, and he decided to put all in for the American market and I guess that he succeeded quite well. So in the early 1950s, there were a lot of um, new buildings that had tunnel lights all across the United States, especially the areas where there were a lot of Finnish residents or Finnish-born residents. And um, uh, tunnel later moved his business uh, completely to the United States, so he had uh, tunnel light as well as uh, other ventures uh, that manufactured his designs uh, as late as uh, early 1970s. By then they were you know, out of style and out of fashion, but in 1940s and 1950s, so these were immensely popular. And now that you think about the retro aspect of Finnish design, so tunnels, uh, uh, lamps and light fixtures are quite popular by all the collectors, uh, especially in Europe, but also here in the United States. Uh, inspiration for Finnish design and glass design especially came from the nature. So here you can see uh, uh, objects that have been um, exhibited in the Milan Triennals in early 1950s. Uh, uh, should I say it's not a vase, although they always keep saying it's an orchidea vase, but uh, Orchidea, Orchidea by Timo Sarpaneva and Chanterelle by uh, Tapia Virkkala. And uh, this was the era of uh, Finnish uh, in-house designers that uh, finally the Finnish uh, uh, producers 
and companies understood that there would be a demand for uh, in-house design and started to hire designers that had finished the craft school in 1940s. And uh, Sarpaneva and Virkala are the first big names of, of Finnish design, especially glass design, but they made a variety of different kind of design also. And um, here you can see how the Chantral Ways was promoted back in 1950s. So this is uh, one runner-up for Miss Finland uh, doing this kind of an impersonator of Midsummer Night's Dream with the chanteral vases. There were several sizes, those, those are not the rare ones, actually. Um, as I mentioned uh, with Jack Arenberg, Guy Frank, so um, he started to be the head of design for the Arabia porcelain factory, and uh, they had been manufacturing a lot of, lots and lots of uh, these uh, flower print cups and, and coffee cups. We Finns do like to drink coffee, so there was a strong demand on those ones. But Kai Frank wanted to change everything, and uh, his Gilda series of uh, cups, mugs, and plates, it's not a tableware set as we speak. So it wasn't a huge success, but needed a lot of marketing to get it going on in, uh, in Finland. And uh, this was also sold in the United States, uh, but I'm not sure how popular it became here. So nowadays when you buy, for example, the popular Moomin mugs, so Kai Frank's original Kilda design, or the a little bit adjusted Tema design is uh, the base for the Moomin mugs. He was also uh, gained a stipendium for uh, visiting the United States in 1955. So he made a round trip in, in quite a lot of different places. Here you can see that he visited UCLA as well as New York, the Museum of Modern Art. And these are his uh, short notes that he has taken on his trip to the UCLA, for example, he talks about the, uh, mm, the curriculum of, uh, uh, and, and how, the, for example, the ceramics were um, taught in the UCLA department, and also makes these small uh, funny notes like there was flies in the barbecue and that sort of thing. So these are uh, somehow very um, like uh, designer-based uh, notes, and on the other hand, uh, this kind of a small funny things of everyday life. Then we have um, Marimekko and uh, the era from 1950s to 1960s onwards. So design research based in Cam was Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, founded in 1953, was actually the place where Marimekko dresses were first sold. And, um, and also there, uh, I think that it was the uh, first wife, uh, or, or president's wife, Jacqueline Kennedy's secretary, private secretary, that found uh, 12 different pieces of Marimekko uh, dresses for her to wear during one of her pregnancies. Here you can see a Sports Illustrated uh, cover from December 1960, where one of the Vuokko Nurmesniemi designed and Marimekko produced pieces are on her. And uh, we got the chance to buy a couple of the original uh, uh, dresses to the Design Museum Helsinki collection in late 2010. Uh, so on, on the other side, you can see this original dress. And these were all designed by Vuokko Nurmesniemi, uh, who also said that uh, the, the kind of the, the fame that she get or got from the uh, Sport Illustrated cover as well as the dresses, wasn't uh, too much of an amusement for Armi Ratia, the founder of Marimekko. So there was um, some fights, and Vuokko decided to leave Marimekko for good in 1960. And uh, I think that they never sort of spoke to each other ever again. So <laughs> that's also traditional. Not, I don't know if it's a, you know Nordic design <laughs> or has to anything to do with that, mood, but people usually won't sort of give up. They stand their ground. <laughs> and that's exactly what Armiratia did. Well, 
Vuokka had her ups and downs. Uh, over here you can see uh, Vuokka Nurmesniemi together with uh, her husband, uh, Antti Nurmesniemi, interior architect. And here they are in the Finnish pavilion in Milan Triennale in 1964. And this was a very um, minimalistic, uh, decreased uh, setting for the show or the exhibition there. So they are standing amongst javelins that Finnish uh, company had produced. So there were boats, javelins and skis presented on the exhibition. And uh, it was widely discussed that is this Finnish design? Is this good design? Is this Nordic design? And uh, Antti Nurmesniemi uh, is a well-known Finnish interior architect and has done a lot of designs, for example, uh, the Finnish government. And here you can see the sauna stool from the Palace uh, Hotel, uh, which originally was designed for the 1952 Olympic Games and for the visitors of the Olympic Games. Um, then came the era of plastics. And I'm sure that once you go to Swedish and Danish uh, design, there's also going to be discussion about plastics and uh, whether it was a good material or whether there was actually something going on before the oil crisis in 1973 or uh, should it have been supported more, for example, government-based funding and that. But here you can see the uh, globe chair, the ball chair. Uh, it has many names by uh, Eero Arnio. And uh, over there you can see the mold that they use for still making the uh, same ball chair in a traditional way. So it's made in a similar way, laminated like a, like a, like a boat. And 1960s also saw the era of uh, sleek, uh, stylish Finnish glass to end and uh, up came this kind of a very vivid melting ice-like designs. So this is uh, Ultima Thule by Tapio Virkkala and it was originally designed for um, a Finnish aviation company Finnair and their flight to New York in 1969 and afterwards was also taken into mass production and this is still produced even today. So it's one of the most popular pieces of Finnish design. And of course, you cannot talk about Finnish design without mentioning Björn Wekström and his planetoid valleys and the space, uh, space um, silver jewelry that he designed from 1960s onwards. So this is actually the necklace that are, is presented on Princess Leia in the first, or is it the third sequel of Star Wars? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> sure, I'm not sure, I've lost count. <laughs> but anyway, so um, uh, it was a bit of a happenstance that they actually got it there. Lucasfilm producers were looking for this kind of a modern, uh, not traditional like jewelry, and uh, found out that there's this uh, young Finnish designer called Björn Wekström, who's made this kind of a space-like jewelry and uh, they uh, called his agent, and the rest is history, even Finnish design history. Well, the 1980s saw a bloom in economy in Finland, and there were a lot of uh, um, tryouts and, and all kinds of uh, uh, prototype designs going on. Uh, we didn't have this kind of a postmodern movement, and uh, uh, we didn't have um, a lot of uh, interesting pieces going on, a lot of furniture design, of course, because uh, as much as we like to drink coffee, we also like to sit. <laughs> and uh, one of the uh, design stories that need to be mentioned is, of course, Nokia and the Nokia mobile phones. And uh, this is the communicator 19,000 or 9,000, uh, the first ones. And it's an actually, um, I met the designer, Panu Johansson, who was running the dis Nokia design team back in 1990s. And he told me that uh, they visited all of the um, car companies, car producing companies here in the United States to get inspiration for the design of the piece. So it was the head of the Nokia 
uh, who thought that this would look masculine, this would look streamlined if it was designed, the phone was designed like a car. So um, that is the reason why it has these round edges, for example, and uh, this uh, antenna that you can then turn once again. Don't know that much about the uh, technical um, uh, history or, or how that was affected, more of the design thing. But Nokia was uh, this kind of a rising company that also uh, then um, quickly melted away once uh, the last um, economic crisis in 2008 began. And that hit hard Finnish younger designers that now uh, understood that there would be design jobs, but less of them, they would be paid less, and there was uh, really big problems to get, uh, for example, um, design jobs uh, on the field. So the solution was to start your own company, as did Paula Suhonen for Ivana Helsinki. This is a clothing company that was uh, super popular back in uh, early um, 21st century. And, um, and uh, this is one of their um, runaway shows from the Paris Fashion Week that you can see here. Knives and Feathers is called the, uh, the actual collection. And Paola Suhonen is an interesting figure because uh, later when she decided that she wouldn't no longer design dresses, so she started to produce, for example, music festivals and uh, started to make all kind of uh, this kind of knick-knack things to uh, get living. And on the other side, you can see Stefan Lindfors' uh, um, experimental uh, lamp called Scaragou. So this is like an ant or, or other kind of um, insect that would then nod for you once you put the light on. And uh, Stefan Lindfors is also one of the designers that uh, decided that he wouldn't no longer do this kind of a traditional design. He produced films as well as television series. And uh, I don't know what he does nowadays. <laughs> Probably sits in the local bar. <laughs> and uh, some of the newer things are, for example, Milla Vahtera, this uh, mobile uh, that you can see here is uh, by her design team. Uh, she has been raised by two jeweler makers and uh, she was actually interviewed a couple of days ago on the Finnish press and she told that it's marvelous that she can go uh, whenever she likes, uh, take her kids to kindergarten, buy milk and then post one of her art pieces or design an art pieces to, uh, to Dubai. That it's amazing that even the kind of uh, not so cultivated, not so sleek design gets its audiences nowadays. And on the other side, you can see Kusta Saksis uh, work archipelago. It's located in Brussels in the European Union headquarters. Uh, Kusta Saksi works in Tilburg in uh, the Netherlands and uh, makes these large jacquard pieces, textile pieces. And at the moment, the Design Museum in Helsinki has his uh, solo exhibition going on. And this is a funny anecdote because we had uh, visitors from Seattle visiting our museum in the summer, and they were really keen to have the Kusta Saksi exhibition here. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that's it all in all. I hope I didn't exceed my time that much. If you want to give me feedback, and we have maybe time for couple of questions afterwards so you can use the QR code my boss would be thrilled <laughs> so kiitos thank you Hi. i'm shelly salem uh, i was i'm the curator of design and contemporary art at the indianapolis museum of art and uh, i want to thank you all for coming today it was a wonderful turnout and thank you, Leslie, for inviting us here. So the format of this program is uh, Susanna presents on uh, beautiful, magical designs from Finland, and then I get to ask a couple of questions about the presentation uh, based on 
my own knowledge of Finnish design and um, Finnish designers in America, and then hopefully we'll have some time to open it up to questions from the audience. First, I thought you, you spoke uh, a number of times about uh, Karelianism uh, and the region of Karelia, particularly having an impact on late 19th, early 20th century design in Finland. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about that region, um, where it is, what country it is now located in today versus then, and uh, the folk traditions there, how they had an impact on uh, designers in Finland. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So Karelia was located as part of the Grand Duchy of Finland uh, in late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, and uh, nowadays uh, most part of it is located in Russia. But there's still Karelia left in Finland as well. So there's uh, Southern Karelia, Northern Karelia, and uh, there's this uh, vivid, quite rich uh, ornamental style that hasn't got that much to do with the Scandinavian minimalism. Uh, uh, and uh, there's a rich tradition in handicrafts, for example, a lot of um, carpentry craftsmanship, as well as uh, textiles that are really um, very, very intricate and detailed pieces. And why do you think that, because the, you know, uh, like Axel Galen, for instance, was not from Karelia originally, but very inspired by the motifs and the designs and the handcraft. Why do you think that that region resonated so much with Finnish designers during that time? Well, the National Board of Antiquities uh, sent uh, students for this kind of um, trips around Karelia. And uh, I think that um, they sort of thought that this would be the original the kind of an, the, they were looking for this kind of an original place for original Finnish style, and Karelia was thought to be that place, uh, with little to know this kind of influences, neither from Russia or from Sweden, but it had its own rich culture. So I think that that was the one, w the, the most important reason for their interest. Yeah, that makes sense considering at the time there's sort of this wave of national romanticism for many European countries, right? It's Sweden and Denmark, and they all have their own versions of Jugendstil and Art Nouveau, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. So um, one of the things that has always interested me about Scandinavian design, and, and particularly Finnish design, is the way that is sort of, or was, I should say was marketed or uh, presented as sort of this unified vision that is a representation of the Finnish people, and, that, and particularly in the, in the mid-century. Um, but for instance, and it, there's always this emphasis on a connection to nature, uh, a sort of uh, reference to primitivism in uh, sort of a subjugating way uh, because also you have to remember as you said that uh, Finland for a long time was part of other empires Sweden and then uh, Russia and my understanding is that a lot of the upper class members um, of Finnish society spoke Swedish yeah that's correct so uh, there's this kind of conjuring of a national identity that begins, uh, particularly in World's Fairs, when you think about the 1939 World's Fair in, in New York, Alvar Aalto designed the Finnish National Pavilion for that World's Fair, uh, and it had these large photographs of the Finnish national landscape, uh, different parts of the landscape, and then photographs of Finnish people. And uh, this was a trend that continued on in design fairs and in world's fairs uh, for several decades, uh, even in 1958 in the Brussels World World's Fair. That pavilion was designed by Tapio Verkela, so we saw his beautiful glass designs in your presentation today, particularly the Chanterelle vase. And that was another pavilion that was wood paneled, an emphasis on nature, and they actually every day would spray it with pine oil, so it had the smell of pine. 
Um, and sorry, I'm going on, but I promise you this is <laughs> leading to a question. Um, so, and one of the, and to me, I think it, all of these are sort of perpetuating a representation of the Finnish people uh, and how that manifests through design. And I have a quotation here uh, from 1945 from a Swedish ceramicist and glass artist named uh, Tira Lundgren, who had lived and worked in Finland for over a decade at this time and was commenting on an Arabia porcelain exhibition. And uh, this is what she had to say uh, about Finnish design and Finnish people. She said, as a people, the Finns have a unique strength, a primitive artistic drive with which they charge their work. It is a strange mixture of witchcraft and backwoods melancholy, glowing colors and gray poverty, paganism, a yearning for beauty and an enduring strength. Their sense of form does not stem from classical antecedents, very interesting considering you showed examples of classical antecedents, nor is it based on shapes developed by man over the millennia. Their archetype is the primitive nature around them, forms which could be carved from wood with a puko knife dictated by feelings and instincts alone. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that she grasped the essence of Finns and Finnish design there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's um it's like um yeah, considering Tura Lundgren's work mm -hmm. in, in Finland, which was very classicistic mm -hmm. to to be fair. So um I think that she has nailed it quite well that what Finnish design would be like uh, compared to Nordic design. Mm -hmm. That there are these uh, small things, details uh, that we have of our own, and then there's lots and lots of things that we have in common with you know, Swedish or Norwegian or Danish design. That's interesting because for me, it feels like a stereotype almost in a way. Is it, is there like, is there nuance there or? It might feel as a stereotype, but um, mm, yeah, I wouldn't say so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because there are elements and details that uh, we Finns do appreciate and mm -hmm. and you know like about the design and about uh, the fact that we would spray pine <laughs> oil <laughs> on our walls just to keep it you know authentic mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way. So um, I think that uh, she has captured the essence. I know what you might mean with the kind of stereotypical uh, things, uh, issues with, uh, with Finnishness, but uh, we do love our puko knives and uh, <laughs> we have them everywhere. I, I don't have one right now, <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> they wouldn't let you take it on the no. plane. <laughs> <laughs> so I left it home. But anyway, so I think that, uh, yeah, there are stereotypes, but a lot of things that are of essence there. Okay, gotcha. Um, and so you, do you feel like that is sort of, it's interesting being in this museum of Nordic culture, um, where there's a, you know, I think a great representation of, um, how these cultures feel unified in certain ways. Uh, but of course there are many extreme differences too. And, um, and do you feel like that is, at least, that is how it is manifested within Finnish design? Yes, and uh, of course, uh, the richness and uh, longer history of, for example, let's say, cultures in Denmark and Norway. For example, we didn't have the Vikings coming to our neighborhood. Uh, so, um, so I guess that, um, yeah, the exhibition shows here shows very clearly the differences, but also the uh, the connections, the ways that we can connect to the Nordic design. Hope I'm answering your question. Yes, yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and a special thanks to Susanna Teal and Shelley Salem.